Well, it's good to be in the house of God today. Amen. Amen. Let's go in the Word of God together to the book of James, chapter 3. James, chapter 3. And would you uh, stand with me, please? I'm going to read some verses of Scripture here. I'm simply preaching today on little things of God that count. God's little things that count. Amen. You know, when we uh, analyze our thinking and our dreams and our goals and our desires, it seems like everything is big. Amen. You know, God uses the little things. Aren't you glad of that? Right. Amen. Aren't you so glad of that? So I'm going to be preaching on the little things that God uses, and we we can get a lot of so many small things. And that God uses, it's incredible that I want to bring out to our attention this morning and to use some Bible illustrations. And uh, for the scripture base, we're going to go to James chapter 3 on the little, the little thing that we all have that gets us in trouble is our tongue. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to specialize on that because everybody will feel bad if I begin to preach on the tongue. Amen? <laughs> Tongue's a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Right. Okay, so we, we, we one of the biggest problems all of us have is our tongues. Right. Words are so important. They are. Okay, what you say makes an impact on, on yourself and others and uh, even to the ears of God. So let's uh, begin reading at verse uh, 1, chapter 3. My brethren... So now you know who this is addressed to, to the believer. You do not expect unsaved people to have a, a decent tongue. Amen? Wickedness is in their hearts, and, and, and what's in the heart proceeds out of the mouth. But we as brethren and Christians need to really watch and pay real special attention to this. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Now I want you to mark this verse. This is so important. If we offend not in word and we do not misuse our tongue, we're able to, to master the whole body. If you can control your tongue, you can control anything in your life. Right. When right. the tongue gets out of control, everything else goes haywire. Right. All right? Let's look at uh, some small things now that's important. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great, are driven on fierce winds, yet are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasts of great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, and a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, and it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. And every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. All right? So that's the message on the tongue. But that's just the little member that gives it problem. There's many other little things I want to bring to your attention that God uses. But remember, even that little member that can be evil 
can be awesome for God. In Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Because I want to take you back to that verse too. If in many things we are in many things we offend all, but if any man offend not in word or with what words you speak, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So we need to use our speech for the betterment of God and the kingdom of God. Say amen right now. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, we love you and thank you for the privilege to preach. Thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you, dear God, for using little things. If it weren't for that, nobody in this room would be used. And I thank you, Lord, for, for providing and leading and guiding and, and picking uh, the things that men astound the, the minds and the hearts and the thinking of the mighty men. Use the simple things, dear God, to perform your perfect will. The things you created, the things you formed, the things you uh, lead with your desire to be used for the betterment of the kingdom of God. And we thank you for it. Use this message now for our understanding and for our growing close to you, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I would just say this, I have never heard in our day and time uh, language coming out of the mouths of little babes right. so so filthy and so raw. And you know where that is. It, it comes from the home. When, 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 when speech is wrong, that's what stores up in our mind. And our mind's like a computer. And you hear that over and over and over. So today, you hear language openly, even on the television, things that the little words that should have never been used would not have been allowed. On networks, it's, it's, it's worse and worse and worse. And so speech is so, so important. But especially to the believer. You see, we praise God with our mouth, and out of our mouth should not come those things. And I think we know that. And we have to put a check uh, upon uh, upon our language. And uh, uh, how many of you remember the, the down through the course of your life, probably many, many times, where you said something before you thought and you got in trouble? Amen. <laughs> what gets us in such a mess? And then it's so, it's, people will say things, you know the bad thing about telling a lie is you have to remember what you told. Right? <laughs> because you get nailed down the line. Amen? That's why you need to, to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God always. And use that speech uh, to, to be an uplift or an encouragement. Do you understand the, the, the speech of attitude, of, of bad attitudes or, or uh, negative thinking? Uh, you promote that kind of stuff. Do you know that you can discourage people? You can, you can cause somebody to take their own life. If somebody's right on the brink that they don't have much to live for anyway, and you, and you just push them over the edge, you can, you, can, you can save a life by encouragement. You can destroy a life, uh, you know, by saying the wrong thing to the, to the wrong people at the right time, and you can push people over the edge. Right. Right. We need to be aware of that. Amen. Amen. And especially in a Christian, uh, God doesn't expect anything but righteous conversation to come from our hearts and our mouths, okay? And so uh, it's just astounding. I, I've told this before, but uh, one of the services that David and I in our family was singing, and uh, one, when we was doing this gospel singing, this guy sitting in the back of the church, he was having, oh, praise the Lord, and he was uh, hooping and hollering and but having a good time in the Lord, I thought, man, I wish I had a church full of spiritual people like that. Till we got out to the soul winning table and to where the CDs were, and in the, right by the soul winning table, David heard him using curse words right at the table and speaking to somebody else. How can you do that? Why would anybody praise the Lord in the sanctuary and curse him in the vestibule? Right. You know. It, don't, it doesn't make sense. So we have, to, we have to guard our conversation because words carry power. Yeah. Attitudes with which we deliver those words, uh, you know, that's why it's so important 
uh, for especially for preachers to watch what to say. It's not necessarily what you say, but it's how you say it. You know, it's hard to preach on the subject of hell, but we do because people have to be warned. Right. And so if we can, in love, let them know that we're not <laughs> preaching that. We're not preaching that to be mean to people. Right. But with a sincere heart and with love, we preach on hell. With a sincere heart and love, we preach against sin. Why? Because sin is what's taking the lives of those that we're preaching to. Right. We, we need to preach the whole counsel of God. And we need to preach it with love. And it's how you say something, not necessarily what you say. It's the attitude with which you see it. So the Bible uh, talks about in many things we offend all. And I, I understand that sometimes when people... You, when you, you know you're right and you're defending a cause, that's why you shouldn't argue to the point where you get so bitterly hostile that you get angry and mad. And that your attitude changes. You never win an argument. You right. never do. Because no person seems to be convinced, they are unconvinced still. Yeah. Okay? And so that's so important. And so, uh, I want to talk about some of these little things that God uses, okay? And right after that uh, statement right there, to encourage us to use right kind of speech, uh, verse 3, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. Okay? That's number one. Bits in horses' mouth. Now, you know what that is. It's a bridle put on, a bit in their mouth, and the reins is on that, and guess what? We use that bit and that bridle to guide and to steer the horse, to get it to obey. If you pull back on those bits, and it's affecting that horse's mouth, guess what he's going to do? He's going to stop. If you pull on the left, and that bit go on, oh, takes that side of the horse's jaw. He's, it's going to guide him left. It's going to guide him right. But here, we use that for direction in traveling with the horse. Amen? But here's what I want you to see. And I'm going, I was going to wait to the end to give you the thunder behind this. But I think I'll just give you the thunder while I'm on these little things. Okay? Okay? Without a rider and a person on the horse... To hold the reins and pull it, that little bit in the horse's mouth is absolutely useless. Every little thing that I'm mentioning is always attached to a person. Always. <coughs> the next thing we want to look at is, behold also the ships that are so great and driven with the fierce winds. They're huge. They're, they're sailing, but yet... There's a little tiny helm at the bottom of that ship. Just a little tiny helm that puts the direction of that huge ship in whatever way it will go. That direct that thing is used to direct the direction of the ship. Here's the thunder. Without somebody at the top, without a person at the wheel to turn it, that helm is useless. That's right. Amen. Are you getting this? Right. Every little thing God uses is connected with the person. And also that goes with the member of our body, the tongue. Okay? If we're connected to the Spirit of God and we're tuned into the conversation we ought to have, and most of all we're, we're tuned out to the conversation that we're not supposed to have, and we can control our speech and our tongue and do it in a way that we're not offensive. And you can tell the truth and be offensive. By the way, this Word of God is the most offensive thing anybody could ever have. Yeah. And, uh, because it's truth. And it, it separates us out from, from what God says. And, and our minds and hearts and training and thoughts and, and dreams and desires and all that. We, we think about the big things. God uses as a little thing. But the truth of the Bible... This Bible is sharp. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. It divides the spirit. It divides. Uh, it's a discerner of the heart. To the intents of the heart. 
and it goes all the way down, deeper than you can even imagine within you, the Word of God cuts. But guess what? The wrong in our life has to be cut out. Like when cancer comes and you go to a surgeon, well, doctor, I don't want to, I don't want to face a scalpel and I don't want to be cut upon, so just give me a pill and hope my cancer will go away. Hey, let me tell you, if you've got cancer, you want it cut out. It will kill you. And the things in our life, the Word of God cuts it out, but guess what? The sand of the Holy Spirit is there. Uh, you know, I like to... I, I like to think of the of the preacher as the doctor. I like to think of the Word of God as the scapel. I like to think about the Holy Spirit of God as the one that puts the healing salve after the cutting is gone. Have you ever noticed when something's wrong in your life and you wouldn't count it wrong and finally when you straightened it up and got repented and close to God and found out you developed the you knew what, the, what that thing was is wrong now. All of a sudden, <laughs> where you used to feel bad when that thing was mentioned or when it was there, but now you feel great because there's the sound of the Holy Spirit of God. There's a calmness. I've gone through this. It's over. I've got a God that can heal me. I've got a, a God that can love me. I've got a God that can forgive me. I've got a God that can help me. Right, and the boy, that that, and you learn that what you thought was bad is good, and what you thought was good was bad. Because when we we conform to God, it's all about uh, conforming to God, and so that's what that is with the tongue. I've got to hurry very quickly now. I just want to. I thought about a few other things I'd like to have time to bring you, but uh, I, I looked at Jesus, and I looked at God in creation, first in Genesis chapter one. What did God use to make us? Out of the dust of the ground, He formed man in His image and breathed in His nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Right. You and I are dirt. Yeah. <laughs> they should not understand that. In the ground itself, there are 16 elements in the, in the, uh, in the ground. I don't have them all memorized. Iron, zinc, phosphorus, all you know. 16 elements, iodine, all those elements that's in the earth, in the dirt of the earth, is found in the human body. 16 of them. I thought when I, when I read that and studied that out, man, that is awesome. Well, 16 elements of, of the ground is, is right in our bodies. You know why? Because God made us out of dirt. Yeah, man. There was a blind man sitting by the wayside that was blind and he was crying. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus reached down and got a little piece of clay. And get this, and he spit on it. The Bible calls it spittle. It's just plain old hillbilly spit. <laughs> That's what it is. He spit on the clay and anointed the eyes of the blind man and God healed that blind man through the spittle and the clay. God used spittle and clay. Isn't that amazing? He used the dust of the ground. That's just amazing to me. And we just came not long to go through the Christmas season. And I brought a message upon that little star of all of the billions and billions of stars in the galaxy in, in the celestials in the heaven there was one little star that sat there for millennials after millennial and was never noticed until one day God said give me a little star and he called it out he made it the brightest and he made it to guide the wise men over to where baby Jesus was found in the manger God used that little star. But without the wise men following that star, what good would that star have ever done? What would it have accomplished had it not had wise men? Amen? You getting the thunder? The thunder is God uses people in everything. That's the only plan God put together when He put salvation. Is to give us the infallible, inerrant Word of God. 
empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to give out with command the Word of God from people. Right. And the Spirit of God and God does the work. All you and I are as mouthpiece and the instruments of love in the hand of God to give the gospel of salvation to a lost and dying world. To those we love. We ought to love the sinner as well as the saint. And how we use our tongues. See, because the only way to do it, that's the only way someone can be saved. The Bible said, faith without faith, you can't be saved. And all faith comes from God. What, how do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the Word of God. And notice, I believe, I, I believe in lifestyle evangelism. People have to look at our life and see Jesus. And that's important because of your influence you have over others. But you can live a perfect, good Christian life and keep your message of salvation to yourself and people could die in their sin watching your 100% Christian life except your failure to witness. They could die in their sin and split hell wide open because they did not hear. Right. How can they hear except somebody speak? Right. And so God called us all to give out the Word of God and to be a witness. I begin to think about a few other things. Uh, I don't have time to turn to these scriptures, but I'll just refer them to you. Another small thing that was used was the staff in the hand of Moses. Right. Just a little staff in the hand of Moses. And if you were to look at Exodus chapter 4, verses 7 and 14 and 17, uh, in, in, in chapter 4, uh, the first thing I want to mention is when God was telling Pharaoh, or Moses, you go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Pharaoh was hard-hearted. He wouldn't listen. So God had to do a miracle through that little staff, all right? And the first thing he did is it became a serpent. Give me a break. A snake coming out of a stick? That would take God, amen? And it happened. It's recorded right there. And then uh, those other imitators, they wanted to do, do the same thing. But you can't do what God does. <coughs> but I want to call your attention that when God said, put forth your, your staff, Without being in the hand of Moses, that was just a stick with no power. Right. The power came from the man in his hand. Right. Amen. Right. And that's important. And then uh, in there, and God said, "Put forth your staff and smite the rivers, and the rivers became blood." Right. That staff wouldn't have ever been able to do that, except it was in the hand of Moses. God used the staff not only to send other plagues, but the serpents and the river of blood. And finally, when Pharaoh's heart was unhardened and he got sick and healed with all the people who was fighting him and all those plagues of lice and frogs and all the other stuff, he learned his lesson. He let those people go. And now they're at the Red Sea. And now, now Pharaoh changes his mind. Hey, let's take our army and let's go kill them. They pursued after them. And there they stood at the Red Sea with, with no escape whatsoever. And Pharaoh's army pressing in on them. And God said, reach forth your hand and your staff and put it over the Red Sea. And God parted the Red Sea. Right. Heaps of walls of water stood up and they crossed on dry ground. Right. Non-Bible believers like to make fun of those Bible stories. Well, at that certain time of the year, you've got to understand something. The sea, uh, the tide went out, and that sea right there, that spot was only three inches deep. 
They told that to a preacher friend of mine. He said, well, that makes it even a greater miracle in the world. How did Pharaoh and all those armies of thousands of people and horses drown in three inches of water? Yeah. <laughs> right. See? God, God did it. But again, it was not the staff. It was the staff in the hand of Moses. God gave that instrument to his hand to use. I don't know what God may have to give you to use, but I've got, no, I've got news for you. I know one thing you've got. You've got a mouth. Yeah. You've got a tongue. You've got a Bible. You've got tracts. You've got what you need to give out the gospel. Why aren't we giving it? power is in the obedience of the person to the will of God to use those little things. I'm thinking of Elijah and Elijah. And uh, Elisha wouldn't leave Elijah alone. He had this man and he did these eight great miracles. And Elisha was following him and said, hey, I, 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 when you're gone, I, I want what you've got. As a matter of fact, he asked Elijah, would you give me a double portion of your spirit, of your power? And Elijah said, man, that's a hard thing. He said, but you know what? When, when God takes me away and I drop my mantle and he went away in that chariot of fire, if when God takes me away, if you see me go, he said, then pick up that mantle and the powers that I have will be the powers that you have. It was in the mantle. All right, so he went away. There dropped the mantle. Wow, he's gone. The, the first man in outer space without a space suit or a ship, amen? <laughs> By the power of God, up in the chariot of fire. <clears throat> man, I want a double portion. And he reaches down and he picks up that mantle. And he said, where's the Lord God of Elijah? Because he wanted to cross Jordan. And the Jordan parted. <clears throat> That mantle wouldn't have even been with Elijah gone and not in the hand of Elijah anymore. That mantle would just be a useless instrument lying there where he left. All right. One thing that thrills me, if Jesus Christ were to come right now, this old suit would be laying right here. Yeah. I wouldn't be in these boots. Amen? Yeah. We're going to be resurrected in glorious bodies like the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things you worry over and strive for and sacrifice for and lust after and finally achieve are all going to be gone. How many of you know? Naked came I into the world and naked shall I leave you. The only thing you'll ever take to heaven is what you do for God while you've got breath to serve Him. That's the only thing you'll take. Your rewards are getting, are building up. Everything you put in the offering place is going to meet you there. Every deed you do in the body, a good deed is going to meet you there. There's all, they're all being recorded. There's the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. The books are over <laughs> another book. And the Word of God to tell us how. The record, and we'll give an account for every word, every idle deed, every deed done in the body, whether it's good or bad. Every word spoken, God's got it written down. And when we stand before Him, it'll be revealed to us. Rewards are coming to those that deserve it according to their works. So if we want more, we got to give more. Amen? If we want more, we got to do more. And so that's just some of the little things that God, that God uses. I'm thinking of the little shepherd boy, David, as he faced Goliath. Four small stones. A little simple slingshot. When he went after the giant, and he came with all this. When Saul put that armor upon him, he, he couldn't even walk in it. It was so big and heavy. He said, These are not proven. Away with it. He said, I've got something here called a sling. And one day there was a, a lion that came after my sheep. A little stone slew 
slew that lion. There came a bear and that thing has proved it worked again. And in the name of God, because God had to do that. And when I face this giant, I, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. He went down to the brook and he got four little smooth stones. Just four little stones. Someone said, if he had so much faith, why did he get four stones? Because Goliath had four brothers. He was going to take them all on. But all he needed was one. And guess where it struck? Guided by the hand of God. With that stone within itself, or that little sling within itself, without the hand of David whirling and my faith using it. The giant would have never fallen. Right. God's got something for you that will let you slay those giants in your life. There's no giant too big for God right. when you're with Him. And so is those four little stones. I mean, think of the little that little lady that her and her son was living by themselves and the prophet Elijah came along and was hungry. Would you bake a cake for the man of God? And she said, well, I've only got just a little, little bit of flour left. And I've just got a little, little cruise of oil. I don't know if I have enough. But what I have, I'll make you a cake. And she did. And she took all the food she had, all the substance, and she made the man of God a cake to sustain his life. And from that day forward, every time she went to that barrel, there was meal put there by God. Yep. And she went, that cruise of oil never run dry. She never got a, a dynamic supply, but every single day she went there, God took care of that little widow. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. That cruise of oil and that, and that cake for the man of God ate, just little things that God used, but without the hands of that little mother fixing that for the man of God. Right. There's the clout. It's the little lady. Another little made story that's found in 2 Kings chapter 5 when Naaman the leper, the great mighty warrior of, of, the, of the army, was, was there. And he was a leper. So he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And uh, they had gone down and, to, and captured them. And this little uh, Israelite woman was there. And she was the maid in Naaman's household taking care of uh, Naaman's wife. And saw that, uh, that Naaman had the leprosy. And you know the story of his cleansing. How he finally went. A lot of people was used of the Lord to get into the Jordan River to dip seven times. But if had it not been for that little captured lady in captivity saying to the wife, Would to God that my, that my master, uh, which was, which was uh, Naaman, that he would go to the prophet in Samaria because he would recover him of his leprosy. And the cloud behind that story is if that hadn't have came out from that little captured maid, he would have probably died in his leprosy. Right. God used little people. He used the little widow's might as Jesus and the disciples came into the church. And all of them came and they put their donations in the donation <coughs> box. And here came the little, the little, uh, the, this little widow lady. Little widow, she had no way since then. She took <coughs> The last coin she had, and she dropped it in. God said, Did you see that? That little lady, oh, yeah, Lord, look, look there. That wasn't much. And God said, She gave more than all the rest of them. Because you see, God doesn't measure what you put in the plate, He measures what you keep in your pocket. Yeah. 
she's written in the history book of God. Right. The Bible. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty awesome. I wonder how many times her sermon's been preached from the <laughs> right. across the world. Amen? Yes. The record. Written in the records of God. The little widow's mind. Now, one more and I'm finished. Uh, Jesus had this great crowd of people. 5,000 men plus women and children followed him up on the hillside. Some just followed him for curiosity, but the, men, the, the message must have been long that day. By the mm -hmm. way, they didn't look at their watches to see how soon they could go home right. when, Jesus, when Jesus was preaching. Right. Amen. They were there for so long. The disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, these people came here and they're hungry. And there's no food. We need to provide. What can we do? And so there's a little boy there with five loaves and two fishes. Can you imagine? Jesus said, go fetch the lad's lunch. Bring it to me. Five loaves of bread with thousands of people and two small little fishes. And Jesus began to bless it. Bless it. Hey, man, we have any baskets around here? Yeah, look, let's find some baskets. He began to break. Here. Here, Peter. Here, James. Here, John. He named them all. Hey, go out there and feed the people. He just kept breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking. You know when he got them feeding that crowd and they were all filled, there were 12 basketfuls left. Right. You know what I think he did with them? I think he sent 12 baskets home with a little boy. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Just <clears throat> the loaves and fishes. And the, the, this image is one of my favorite images of all times. It shows humility. It shows prayer. He doesn't even have hardly anything to drink in the cup and a loaf of bread. But there lays his Bible. Yep. And God will use small things to sustain you. Right. When you're right with God, God promises He will take care of it. Oh, if we can only get all of the poor of the world and those that we have our need to know that if they have Jesus in their heart and they're His child, He never lets a child go hungry. David said, Behold, I was young and now I'm old. And there's one thing that I've never seen in all my life. And that's the righteous forsaken for his seed begging bread. Right. Because God promises to take care of them. Amen. Amen. Oh, Jesus is the answer to everything. Amen. You and I don't have the answers except giving out the Word of God. That's the answer. I want to go back to that last little thing, that little, that little thing about the tongue. Let's use our speech for the glory of God. Let's make our speech righteous and right. And let it demonstrate the nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. And when those around us aggravate us, let's ask God to give us patience and understanding. Amen. And have kindness and long-suffering and realize we're living in a world of people that's in a world of hurt. Right. They don't need railed upon. They don't need put down. Right. They don't need strong preaching in a belligerent magnitude. They need to have somebody to tell them that Jesus Christ loves you. Yeah. Right. And Jesus Christ is going to provide for you. Yeah. Uh, Jesus Christ will save your soul from the devil's hell. He'll pick your feet out of the sinking sand and the miry clay. He'll make you something you never dreamed you could be. If we set our desires in our hearts. And at the end of this sermon, what the thunder I want you to see is if God, if God can take uh, words from a tongue and a vital and a bit and a tongue uh, to talk and
dirt and spittle and, and stabs in the hands and, and little stones and little segments of food and acts of kindness and small donations to the offering plates. If God can use all these little things, what in the world makes you think He can't use you? Amen. And we sit and say, well, who am I? What can I do? What difference can I make? Oh, you can make a big difference if Jesus Christ is a difference in your life. Right. Because He will become the difference in those. He will rise you to heights and levels you never dreamed. Amen? Amen. Little things. Little people. Little places. Little me and little you. What does God do? He's glorified and glorified when He takes the little things and confounds the mighty. That's right. right. You can confound the mighty right. through the power of God. Right. Amen? Right. Little things that count, that makes a difference. So you may have to have God to put a pencil in your hand that you can write. You may have to have God to give you what leadership in your life you need to accomplish His will and purpose for your life. And that's why we can emphatically say upon the authority of the Bible, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If you need strength, He'll give you strength. If you need provision, He'll give you provision. If you need finances, He'll give you finances. Right. He never, never will fail you. He will never disappoint you. He will never let you down when you make it your all and all. Amen. Little things. Father, thank You for the time. Thank You for the thoughts You placed upon my heart. Strengthen our life.